There we go. Right, rewilding in a nutshell. I'm going to talk about rewilding. And it's basic ecology, um, but how does that ecology work in the real world? So, Matty Gams Wood, as you probably already know, it's a beautiful classic Sussex gill wood, which means it's wet, it's north facing, it's on a steep bank, and that produce, produces its own little micro habitats. Quite rare. It's home, therefore, to lots of weird fungi, bit of worms, mosses, ferns, that sort of thing. It used to have some really nice species in it. Um, there's a bit of restored relic. Uh, heathland, wooded heathland there, um, and something we need to um, bring back. There's also wet woodland areas that we need to bring back as well. Um, and it's been home to many important species. Now this is, this is one of these little things. Why do things go extinct? Is it because they're going nationally extinct, locally extinct, or have you messed up the uh, habitat in some way? And that's a complex issue because ecology is complex. Once upon a time, I used to do lots of computer modeling on all this kind of stuff, island biogeography, why species go extinct. Is it because that particular water bowl has gone extinct in a few areas or the night jar or the heath fertility? And beforehand, they all used to repopulate areas where you have local extension but if you lose enough sites there's no ability to repopulate anymore and that's how extension works localized extension so learning why you've lost a species and we have lost lots of species and it is a combination national movements of species local movements of species and our own poor management of the water because it's, it's absolutely hotching with rhododendron, as we know that, so, and some cherry laurel and a few other things. So there's Manny Dance and it's uh, glory. I spent half my time on Google Earth, fantastic too. Um, learn how to use GLS systems, all that kind of stuff. They come in very handy. Um, and we're up there. Now, what's the problem with our woodland? It's choking with rhododendron. That's the biggest problem we've got. Other invasive species, there's been a significant biodiversity loss. I've collated all the records, wildlife records we've got going back um, since the 1960s, basically. And we've lost quite a few important species. Again, why has that happened? And then there's the other thing. What has it been its impact on ecosystem services? because we've lost that, and we'll come to that at the end of my talk of the project I've developed. So, priority habitats. Well, heathland and various forms of bog, wet areas, are a real important habitat that's been lost, mostly because we've drained everything, and the way we've managed it. So, Heather and mosses are the key thing you want to just try and return in a woodland. You stabilise the hydrology. We also got to think about deadwood and fungi. Really complicated ecology. How do, why does that fungi grow? What does it live on? What is the deadwood content of a, a woodland? Huh? And the biggest problem around here, and it's all the woodlands, not just Mali Downs, is Woodlands were managed, they weren't like pristine left alone areas. People worked them and managed them. And a combination of planting rhododendron um, for a cover crop for, and they thought for pheasants, when all the posh people thought that shooting pheasants back in about 1880 was a good idea, when they all wanted to form little clubs and rule the countryside by shooting pheasants. Hmm, does that happen today? Um, and that meant the rhododendron was introduced and it took off and it's a major problem across the whole of the UK, but especially in our woodlands. So, rewilding in a nutshell. What is rewilding? It's a word that's often abused. Um, it basically comes from the idea that everything lives in a mutualistic symbiosis. We all have learned to get on with it. 
so complicated because you're not just talking about one animal or one particular tree species, you're talking about all the microorganisms in the soil, all the ways ecology works, how they work in harmony. You know, a tree isn't a tree. A tree only exists with all the mycorrhizal fungi, all the mycorrhizal, all the um, microbes that live in the soil, that create nutrients, that pass nutrients between different plants. And they're all competing each against each other and they're all helping each other. And that's understanding the many layered levels of interactions between animals, plants, birds, how they carry seeds, how they carry nutrients. They're all super important. And understanding that ecology is more important to rewilding than understanding, you know, that a wolf um, helps create rivers and all the nice things George Monbiot says. That's good. It's still true, but you've got to understand that it's, it's on layers of complexity that are much more. So the key to creating high biodiversity processes is getting those natural processes back into any habitat. And if you don't have those natural processes, you will lose biodiversity. And many places, we've just abandoned that because we don't understand what those natural processes are. So this is why I say a big woodland needs a few large herd of horses. That's the first thing. You need a couple of horses, a couple of cows wandering around. Efforts by man, you know, the wildlife trusts, the woodland trusts, they've all been, well, they're starting to do rewilding projects and I've helped a few of them start them. Um, They've all managed habitats, but you know, guy with a chainsaw, guy with a billhook. It's not recreating really natural habitat. It's our concept of what a natural habitat is, and it's very limited because we've only got so much ability, time, effort, tools to recreate a habitat. Nature's far better at recreating habitats than ever we could as human beings. We're pretty rubbish at it. And that's one of the reasons nature conservation has been so limited in the past. It hasn't been able to have crispy, biodiverse habitats, because A, we don't understand, and B, we have not the ability to do it. So, understanding, shifting baseline hypothesis, why our perceptions of nature are so limited and what they are. And if we are humble in the face of nature's complexity, we can work a plan create beautiful natural habitats, brimful of biodiversity that deliver all of the ecosystem services we want that will improve humanity. This is Lower Woods. Now, 30 years ago, I worked for Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust and we acquired Lower Woods, thousand acres of woodlands above Bristol, and inside, it was amazing. And I learned it was amazing because for hundreds of years, it had commoners' rights for wood pasture. That meant you had cows, now and again, going into the woodland. And because of this, it had the most amazing biodiversity, incredible rare butterflies, rare, you know, thousands of nightingales singing in the woodland. It had something special. And when you unpick the reasons why, it wasn't because the, the woodland was managed by it, but it was part of the Badminton estate. But the real reason was it had a few cows going in and out of there. Anyway, I started learning about habitats then and started trying to do some rewilding projects before they were called rewilding. And one of the issues was using these conic ponies was one of the first projects I started doing. But when I got to Kent Wildlife Trust, we took over the Bleen one. And the Bleen Woods was full of coarse and pine and western hemlock, absolutely chucker with rhododendron. A disaster. Why that woodland was destroyed is dead easy. It was bought by a woodland management uh, company called English Woodlands, who were making money from grants. They weren't making money, so the trees weren't actually being used for anything. It's all investment scams, tax dodging, all this kind of stuff. And they planted it, they chopped down the native, well, not really native, um, chestnut is not native, but it was a working woodland with some biodiversity. They chopped it all down, planted uh, 
course, it was pine for the rest of the hen life. And the rhododendron then grew in it because invasive species often tackle habitats that aren't natural. So the man-adapted habitats favour invasive species taking them over. General rule of thumb. But within five years of starting the project to restore it, we turned it from that to this. And that was all through conical ponds. And this all went back 10, 15 years ago. And of course now, it's got these guys in it, bison, which it took 20 years of work trying to persuade people to get the, um, the bison side of the story in. So it's been a real beautiful um, experiment in rewilding, and it really can transform habitats. And if you do it right, you can do it for very little money. So the mobile forest, as some people call it, is it. Creating a forest that isn't static a forest that has all of nature's complexity in it, not just a harmony forest. It's a forest that's got lots of hills. It's got lots of ecological niches of all kinds because you've got animals moving in there, you've got nutrient cycling. You basically create every stage of birth and death of a forest and every type of natural microhabitat that's suited to all the rare creatures that live here. Deadwood plays a super key issue, and that means standing deadwood, deadwood that's fallen over, deadwood that's been buried in the ground. These all create a space for certain types of animals, and they are missing in most of the woodlands we have. And that's part of creating a rewilded habitat. Poo, urine, super important, nutrient cycling. We all forget that if you have a, um, a woodland that's got no animals in it, no large herbivores, it's got poor soils. You know, we all talk about planting trees to save carbon, absolute rubbish. Planting woodlands does not sequester carbon, it releases carbon because the soils are so poor. Do the maths, you'll find out it's true. Do the research. The government's lying to you when they say planting trees uh, sequesters carbon. No, it releases carbon. It's a disaster idea because the carbon in the ground is important. Having the nutrient cycle and having natural habitats will grow the soils. And that's real carbon, as I'll explain a bit later, that's real carbon sequestration. And poo plays a big role. In it. You also have all the, the bugs, beasties. There's a fascinating story. Great bustards went extinct mostly because females can't get enough insect food because they only like really big insects and they can't travel. Nature is all about energy, right? What energy can you take in? Can the bee fly far enough to get all the honey, the nectar to make honey, or is it too far for it to fly? And if it's too far, it dies out. Same with busters. Has it got enough time to go out, grab an animal, take it back, then enough energy to wear with its young? And if you don't have the right type of insects, you then lose that. And a lot of insects require poo. Wild boar, another one of the creatures that I pretty love. Now, wild boar have got a fascinating relationship with oak trees. You think oak trees just happen to be in England and used to dominate England. Well, actually, it's much more complicated. Oak trees dominated woodlands because it's got an ecological relationship with wild boar. Wild boar are the only important seed carrier of acorns. Why does an oak tree create so many acorns? Well, it has to, because the only way for it to have successful offspring that naturally plant itself is to have an animal like a wild boar snuffling around, eating the acorns, and those acorns are then deposited many miles away. Saplings, acorn saplings, won't grow next to their own trees. Predators, um, uh, insects will eat them and destroy them. Disease causes problems. When it deposits the acorn in a nice little ball of fertilizer at the back end of a wild boar, that acorn will grow. It's also within that ball of fertilizer are the spores of all the mycorrhizae or fungi and all of the bugs 
that form a relationship with the oak tree's roots that give it all the nutrients for it to grow properly. It also is the only way to get genetic diversity. If we don't have wild boar in our woods, we're now dooming, if you can think in the time frame of a tree, that it will lose its genetic diversity and you will lose naturally, um, not planted, but set oak trees over many generations. Maybe that's a bit too long for your brains to understand, but in nature, you have to get into the mind of thinking in 500 years, a thousand years, not just in a couple of years. In the uh, wild boar, by rooting around and doing things at the right concentration, they also created a huge range of habitats for other species to live in the wild. Okay. Pine martens. We used to have pine martens everywhere, all around here, but we paid people to kill them all. And you can actually go through the um, fantastic book by a guy called Lovejoy who went through all the records of payments to people for vermin capture. And you can work out and when we lost all the pine martens, all our red squirrels started going extinct and the grey squirrels took over. And where pine martens have come back in Ireland and Scotland, wherever you get pine martens, guess what? You get red squirrels. And they can now outcompete the grey squirrels. And red squirrels come back. I saw a red squirrel in Surrey when I was about six years old at my cousin's house. That's, that's about the last red squirrels that were around here. So just hitting the 80s was the last time red squirrels, but we can have them back. So efforts are in play to get uh, pine martens back. If you look what happened in Ireland, they persecuted pine martens. They brought in laws in the uh, late 90s to protect pine martens and actually enforce them. There's a big difference between having laws and enforcing laws. And you went from 95% gray squirrels 5% red squirrels, it's now 95% uh, red squirrels, 5% grey squirrels. And that's happening even where I come from in Northumberland, as pine martens have come back. And there's, so it's a really good success story. If we pluck one element of nature away, that ripple effect can cause catastrophic things to other parts of nature. And that's what pine martens. So support efforts to have pine martens. And there's a beautiful red squirrel, we must have these guys back across the UK. Beavers. Beavers are what I make my name for because I was part of the team that first reintroduced the beaver to England and it was a big deal. It took a lot of effort and a lot of money. Now what do beavers do? They taught, taught, take a normal tree and they start damming it and they turn it into a complex braided stream full of wetlands and complexity. And that means it cleans the water, it provides, it uh, stops flooding, you know, it holds the water black. And so beaver are the most important of the keystone species for the UK. And I spent most of my career trying to get these guys back into the country. They create amazing habitats for their little beaver ponds they create all that, they kill off some trees and new types of trees grow. Uh, trees like aspen don't grow if you don't have beavers. Once we wiped out the beavers, basically all the aspen trees started dying out in the UK and as beavers have returned, so those aspen trees have started growing. Really complex relationship, all to do with suckering and hydrology and all this kind of stuff, but they literally work together. They're almost as if they've co-evolved together to be the natural partner, just like the, the oak tree. And guess, this is what's amazing. So just like the oak tree provides all those acorns to the wild boar, and without those acorns, the wild boar don't have enough food, fat reserves, to then have their offspring, right at the start of the year in January, for their first sound of their little brood of their piglets. And what does that do? That allows the wild boar to then get brainy enough to have big brains, to then do what they do in woodlands, to know where all the food is, to know that it farms in a way it, it 
you know, it roots around and it kills trees off that you don't like. So the oak one, just like that, the beaver needs the aspen because the aspen is my favorite food plant of the beaver. It gives the most nutrition in the pith of its bark to feed beavers over the winter to allow them to survive. So they've come together in this fantastic relationship, evolved over millions of years. Now, we first released beaver in the Hanbach Bay back in 2002. And it was great. I spent the night in the caravan looking at them when they first released. And they've slowly populated all along the Stour. There's quite a good population, probably about 500 beavers there in the Stour. And they've come up the Great Stour and the Little Stour and to Ashford, and they're now coming on the other side of Ashford a few. And at some stage, a young beaver, you know, just like students going on um, a European road trip or something, they will decide to jump over into the roll. And then, give it another 10 to 15 years, they'll come along and hopefully they'll come into our woodlands here. They also need to jump over here into the middle of the country. And then slowly and surely, and this is going on elsewhere in the country, we're building up the populations and we'll have beaver back to the UK. And that will do amazing things. That will do more for nature conservation than all human efforts. Every scheme by Natural England, every scheme by any charity will pale in insignificance compared to what beavers will do to help bring back wildlife, clean our water, protect ourselves from flooding in the winter and drought in the summer. All will be delivered by the beaver. The wolf. A big scary wild. Right? Now, this is a wolf I actually helped rear and created a habitat for it. Now, wolves have been returning across Europe. You had relic populations in the Apple you had some in the Pyrenees, and obviously you had lots in uh, the Balkans, the, uh, the um, Danic Alps, and the Carpathians. And since we stopped killing wolves, and we brought in legislation, they basically returned to the whole of Europe. We've now got wolves probably 50 to 60 miles away from us um, in France. They've gone right into Denmark. They're all raw about, they went to Belgium and Holland, and they've come back to most. They're, they're all around Paris. Same with beavers, they've returned through that area. So there isn't rewilding going on, basically, because you made it illegal to shoot the dog things. And wolves, as we've learned, give us this thing of having a top predator. Because one of the biggest problems you've got, especially in North East Sussex, is you've got too many deer that are eating all the uh, understory of woodlands and causing a lot of wildlife problems there. So, I've done the fancy um, rewilding stuff. I'm not gonna, now gonna talk about ecosystem services. So the boring bit is, what are, what are ecosystem services? Provisioning. All our food, timber, fiber we need for clothes, well, most clothes, and medicinal plants, things that we directly need come from nature. And if we start killing off nature too much, we're gonna start losing it. Regulatory services. Ecosystems regulation, flood prevention, erosion control, carbon sequestration, pollination, disease control. You'll be amazed at what nature does to help protect us. And without nature, as we lose nature, we lose some of those issues. And then we've got supporting services, soil formation, nutrient cycling, photosynthesis, actually getting complex molecules from the sunlight, and habitat provision, and then cultural services. You know, I feel happy in a woodland. Don't know about you. There's something about being in that green light that just makes me Now, specifically for this site, we've got problems in the valley here 
with flooding. Terrible problems that never happened before. We've got water quality problems. Most of the water in, um, in around, uh, you know, from Hastings up to um, Hythe is awful. You can't go in the sea. You'll get ill. You can't, I, I've got a um, stream outside my stream, drainage ditch, and there's no way I can put my canoe in there. I'll get sick if I go in there and there's warnings against it. It's full of the most awful water quality. It's full of human sewage because we can't keep our sewage separate from the water and it's full of agricultural chemicals that are absolutely awful. And it's getting worse and worse. When I was your age, things were getting better. We had the NRA um, to help monitor water quality and we were improving our water quality. We were improving wildlife. Now, it's getting worse. Carbon sequestration is a big thing. I'll talk about that in a second. And natural fertility of soil, that's a big thing. We're losing our soil. Every farm is not a farm anymore. Um, farm, arable farms. It's becoming an inorganic substrate the growing medium that we pour all the fertilizers on and the plants grow not because of any natural fertility in the soil and that's dicing with our future if we, the more soil we lose the more risky our future comes what happens when we run out of oil where's all that fertilizer going to come from where's that food going to come from does anybody know how to farm in a way that you don't have to pour in thousands and thousands of tons of phosphate So, six months ago, I created the Future Landscapes Trust. And basically, it's all the neighbor of the land director. And we applied for some land. And we got it. Just got 400 grand. And we've got other donations, maybe up to 600 grand now, to start re putting in some ecosystem services. So, here's Mally Downs again. We know the water floods off here. But let's have a look at the whole catchment. So here's Money Downs. The landowners down here in this north facing slope have all joined the project. And that's where a lot of the water pours down. Comes down at here, and of course, all the farmers have been putting lots of drainage in. And it all comes down here, and right down at the bottom at pet level, they now flood. Now, they're now flooding once every two years, when it was supposed to be once every hundred years. And is it because we've got more rainfall due to climate change? Maybe. There's some evidence, but not as much as you might think. Mostly, it's land use changes that are causing the flooding. It's because we've all got access to little mini diggers who can build drainage ditches. And farmers want to get that water off their land and push the problem to the next landowner downstream. And they don't want to think about what they're doing. We started doing, working with some great scientists to work out where the best place is to put all of our natural structures. There's Mally Downs Wood. As you can see, our woodland has got some of the most, the biggest water flows going through it. So we can start putting, and this shows you where our landowners in the project are, and where we're going to start putting the main flood retention structures, water retention structures, and habitat improvements to retain that water, turn it into a giant sponge that when it rains heavily in the winter, it won't flood poor pet level down at the bottom. And we're going to achieve that by habitat improvements. Believe it or not, this is more important than anything else. Creating complex, heathy, wet woodland that's got dense vegetation and natural soils that slows the rainfall traveling over the soil and it lets the water penetrate into the soil as well. If you have rhododendron, which has got bare soil underneath, the water just flows straight over it. If you have complex, peaty, dense soils and subsoils, that sucks the water in and retains it. And in the ravines, in the woodland and all those other woodlands of the valley, we're going to put leaky dams. We're going to pretend we're beavers. 
and that's going to retain the water. I'd rather let the beavers do it because, of course, it would be free. We're going to spend half a million quid doing that. So we turn, we're also going to persuade, try to persuade some of the other landowners to stop ploughing straight down and to plough in a way that's across the flow that retains water. There's also something called key lining where you can go across the contours of the land. We're going to create a number of structures to turn this valley into this giant sponge that will stop the village of Petrol. Here's some pictures of the flooding. As you can see, it's pretty bad. How do I get this to work? Ooh. This is a video. Where do I press on it? No on the screen, it'll be on there. Because it is a touch screen, but I haven't got it yet. Yeah, you can. There we go. And if you think this is just here, it's happening everywhere. Hastings has got terrible problems, both with flooding and that flood water being full of sewage, because when things start flooding, all the sewage out the drains comes out. Pretty good. So, taking that ecosystem services complex into a global arena, we talk about global warming. Do you think global warming is just because of the fossil fuels we use? Or do you think it's actually, when you start modelling it out, it's more due to land use changes? The biggest sink of carbon, it's not the sea, because most of the sea does not interact with the atmosphere. The sea only becomes a problem if we have catastrophic global climate change that changes the seabed, if we raise the temperature by six degrees or something then that will release some of its carbon and then it's game over for humanity, we're gone. But most carbon interacts from the surface of the sea. So that is only about a thousand gigatons of carbon, right? When we're talking about soil, we're talking about two and a half thousand gigatons. So it's more than all the sea, even though it's less area. And it's how the, the soil oxidizes. Whenever we farm, whenever we drain, that sort of now oxidizing carbon straight into the atmosphere. And it's never been modeled really properly. There's lots of models of fossil fuels, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't use fossil fuels, uh, we should uh, not stop fossil fuels going into the atmosphere, we should. But land use changes is the big issue that nobody wants to talk about, and it drives me absolutely insane, because it's too hard for governments to solve, because governments don't want to tell landowners what to do. But if we rewind, if we recreate wet woodlands, if we change the way we treat nature, we can sequester huge amounts of carbon. I once, because I used to do computer modeling, a bit of a nerd, I once worked out if we had beavers into 30% of all the waterways of the UK, that would sequester about each year it would sequester about the same amount of carbon that humans use full stop in the UK. That's the kind of magnitude we could do by having a rewilding. So, how do we make a world where rewilding happens? And here's a few fundamental solutions for you to think about. We've got to think about efficient use of land. We don't use land. We waste land. And there is a way to solve that. It won't cause poverty, won't cause, well, it will cause poverty for banks and a few rich landowners, but it won't cause poverty to anybody. Stop taxing our wages and start taxing land and set a land value tax as its norm. That changes the margin of use of land, it concentrates everybody to use the land that's already developed, and it will put a burden, it will be cost people to use land um, that isn't very good. We stop subsidising um, farming and stop subsidising any form of land use, take away all the tax breaks that landowners get because they get massive tax breaks. Oh boy, do they get tax breaks. Um, take all that away, start charging, and then you will see land come out of agriculture, come out of use, and we get rewilding for free. Nature doesn't require a penny. 
Nature grows itself. It doesn't take any money to save nature. It just stops. We have to stop ourselves making a profit from its abuse. And that's the economy we need. We need spatial planning, real national parks, not the excuse we've got of national parks at the moment, which are just old farming parks. They're not national parks at all. Um, big nature reserves and the nature grid to connect everything together. And here's the thing, if we take the idea of taxing land and put it into a wider picture, and what we need to do is every time we do harm, that should be taxed. And when we do good, that shouldn't be taxed. So it's externalities, economists call it. We should tax externalities. So get rid of that, get rid of national insurance, and start taxing all the externalities. Keep the oil on the ground, keep the pollution uh, from going into the um, atmosphere and into our waterways. And you do that by taxing the people and you get rid of all the taxes on our wages. So you solve, just solve poverty. Because if you stop taxing wages, there's no poverty trap. You can get, you can earn more money, wages rise, and your cost of living goes down. Rents and house prices will go down. Perfect world. Um, so we'd have a super, great environment and economy and we'd all not be in poverty. Anyway, that's my thoughts. I'll take your questions. Thank you, Peter. All beavers, I think.